Picture this. It's an average Thursday night. You're just doing your thing. That thing being playing your groovy blue-red combo deck in a game of Commander with all your cool friends. You're out there, drawing the cards, making the plays, living your best life. The pivotal moment fast approaches. A pesky Thalia hits the board. Not to fear, you've got a counter. Your Kiki-Jiki meets a Dissipate, and though the ensuing counter war is lost, you've got a backup plan. You throw down that Splinter Twin. What follows is those dreaded words. In response, it's a removal spell. Suddenly, this game has become a lot less cozy. What's the backup plan, champ? You keep cycling through your deck, finding plenty of draw and mana, but nothing much of use. Things are desperate. Where do you even go from here? Well, you don't. Go from here, I mean. Combo holds an interesting position within the landscape of Magic the Gathering. Is it a type of deck? A type of wind con? A flavor of playstyle? Yes, it is indeed these things, and probably many more. The basic gist of what combo is is exactly what it sounds like. A combination of cards that together do something much stronger. The spooky scary version is a two or three card combo that wins on the spot, such as Splinter Twin Pestermite, but there also exist infinite mana and infinite life combos that need additional cards to win, as well as less game ending combos that only win situationally or even just generate a lot of value. Though combo is wide ranging and has undoubtedly been part of the game for basically its whole existence, a lot of players have a negative association with it, and I think it's useful to explore why that might be. To start with, it's pretty common for combo decks to feel uninteractive, and like they win out of nowhere. You can be doing your own game plan and watching with dread as your opponent spends very little resources on board state and interaction, instead relentlessly digging their way toward a one-turn win, until either they find it, or you reduce their life total to zero. This kind of magic isn't particularly fun for anybody, it's just another kind of solitaire. The other thing I've seen complaints about is the fact that, in a way, a lot of combo decks break the rules of the game, as understood by most players. Games that involve conventional aggro, midrange, and control decks feature a common language. Board presence is a thing to be fought over, and cards in life total exist as resources to be taken into consideration and leveraged. By contrast, combo decks throw this playbook in the toilet. They operate using additional, more subtle resources and they can win even when they are behind in board state, life total, and hand size. Now, there are a lot of things to be said about these points, but I'll keep it to this for now. The volatility and uninteractiveness of combo decks can indeed be negatives, and I will be talking about how to minimize them. However, breaking the conventional rules of the game can be a good thing, particularly in a format like EDH. The fact that Commander is a format with 40 health per player and 3 opponents rather than 1 encourages some styles of play which are too risky in 20 health 1v1 formats. These empowered styles tend to be slower and greedier than a lot of what you find in other formats. In mid-power EDH, it's very common to see decks that pile on heaps upon heaps of creature-based value, and then you get decks like my Glissa list, calling card mid-range Crusher 5000, that make it their whole goal to demolish these sorts of decks by piling on an even larger amount of greed. And though I enjoy playing mid-range Crusher 5000, I know that this environment isn't always a very dynamic one. A game where everyone always has big piles of value generating permanence, and where turns involve 5 minutes of abilities and triggers with little movement or strategy or actual action, isn't one I enjoy finding myself in. The fact that there are decks that can cut through the slow, greedy, board-centered decks is a good thing. Now that I've laid out why I think combos and combo decks occupy a useful niche, we can ask the question of the video. Where do they usually go wrong in EDH? I think a lot of it comes down to the structure of the decks. The example I gave in the intro is a deck that's basically an EDH adaptation of 2015-era modern Splinter Twin, a pure combo deck. And the operative word for why that doesn't work so well is pure. So okay, there's this weird paradoxical thing. As you get to higher and higher powers in Commander, combo becomes more and more ubiquitous for the simple fact that everybody's got 120 health to chisel through, right? And it takes a lot of time to fair magic your way through that level of meat. But what this also means is that stacks cards to slow down and break combos also become ubiquitous, much more ubiquitous than they are in a 20 health 1v1 format. The result is that pure combo actually works better in conventional formats, and it is indeed very common for combo decks in these formats to have no other win cons. 
By contrast, for a high-power commander player, who must always contend with the possibility of encountering a quagmire of stacks effects and counterspells, it's a good idea to run alternate win cons, just to be safe. As a high-level example, we can consider Dargo Thrasios, a partner commander pair that is sometimes played in competitive EDH. Thrasios is a beast of a card. It's a generally decent value engine, and, more importantly, it's an outlet for infinite mana combos that's in the command zone. You combo off to get your infinite mana, and then you play Thrasios and draw through your deck to find the kill. Good stuff. Thrasios is real good. Dargo is there to add a bunch of utility. He can be used with Life's Legacy or Greater Good to generate cards, and he can also be sacked to Neoformer Pod to grab Tide Spouts for one of the deck's combos. He also, more pertinently to the point here, is a beefy boy who can 3-tap your opponents, and that can be a useful thing to have in your pocket if your combo plan gets shut down somewhere along the road. The multiple different combo win cons, along with the backup beatdown win con, make the deck exceedingly flexible and adaptable, and help it to weather a lot of challenging situations. However, I hear a clamoring. But Alex, I hear some of you say, I'm not a CEDH player. I'm not going to be facing a wall of stacks high enough to be an eighth wonder of the world. And you know what? That's fair. So for now, let's stop considering what's good and switch to considering what's fun and what works well within a somewhat lower power group. For starters, I'm going to have to crush your dreams a little. Combos are powerful and can be quite fun, but it's important that the combos be well situated within a deck. This means that if a combo is central to the deck, the deck should be able to pull it off reasonably consistently, with the assumption of at least light resistance from your opponents. If the combo is less central to the deck, it should blend in naturalistically with the deck, requiring mostly cards and types of setup the deck achieves through its normal game plan, and not feeling wildly out of sync with the normal game plan. If you put a two-card infinite combo in your low-power midrange deck, your deck is going to be a low-power midrange deck 90% of the time, and an unprotected infinite combo deck 10% of the time. That's going to give your playgroup some serious whiplash, and is decidedly not an example of fun and dynamic gameplay. See part 2 of my budget cards video if you want to hear me waffle about this topic for another 5 minutes or so. For an example of an elegant execution of a lower power combo deck, I'm going to use a deck from my friend Mr. Hans, because he's much more of a Johnny than I'll ever be. He built a Vodrock deck. It's a toolbox mutate deck that tries to generate value through its commander and a suite of other value engines throughout the deck. An equipment sub-theme with several tutors also exists within the deck, giving it access to several reconfigure cards which offer various forms of utility, as well as the central pillar of the deck, Sunforger. With Sunforger, the deck has access to yet a further suite of options, assorted interaction, draw spells, and burst damage, and also a couple of distinctly spicier cards. Glorious End can put an immediate stop to a problematic combat phase, or effectively counter a concerning spell, and Chance for Glory is an extra turn spell that also doubles as a protection spell. For both cards, Angel's Grace can be played on the following turn in order to prevent the lose the game clause. This is a decidedly useful tool on its own, but it is also within the interaction between these cards and the mutate mechanic that the combo exists. Vodrak can repeat low-cost non-creature spells from the graveyard when creatures mutate onto it, and since the mutate stack counts as a single creature, a bounce spell returns the entire stack to hand. So the combo goes something like this. Get an extra turn via Chance for Glory, and prevent loss on that turn via Angel's Grace. Then, repeat this on each subsequent extra turn by mutating three creatures onto Vodrock, one for Chance, one for Grace, and one for a Bounce spell. If you have the correct setup, this means infinite turns and infinite combat steps swinging with Vodrock. Something you may note about this is that, as combos go, this one is very convoluted and difficult to achieve. In addition to the three cards required for the combo, there is also the requirement of having 14 mana and three mutate creatures, as well as the commander. However, this is actually okay for a couple of different reasons. For one, Fodrak isn't a pure combo deck. Maintaining a solid mutate stack with the commander leads to having a decent beater that deals commander damage and generates a lot of value. The deck isn't playing at high power levels, and it can and does win games simply by hitting people, drawing cards, and holding up enough protection to prevent the stack from dying. A common strategy for the deck is to build the stack on top of a man land, which allows it to dodge sorcery speed removal in general, and board wipes in particular. And the pivotal Sunforger boosts Vodrock's power to 7, the exact amount you need to kill a player in 3 hits. It's a very real win plan, with a solid shell for generating value and controlling things. 
The other reason the difficulty of setting up the combo is okay is that all three of the combo pieces have their own utility, and more importantly, the requirement of having a lot of mutate creatures in mana is achieved by the deck just generally doing what it wants to be doing. Generating a lot of value leads to drawing into mutate creatures and mana rocks, and successfully protecting its ever-important Sunforger allows the deck to grab its combo pieces. Everything needed to set up the combo is a solid goal in its own right, so simply playing the deck in ways that are generally effective also naturalistically leads into having the combo. Sometimes the combo will get stopped, but if it does, guess what? The deck has been doing a good job of pursuing its general goals, so you're still going to have a decent shot of winning via commander damage. This idea of combo fitting naturally into the deck is the biggest thing I want to convey here. A combo you run shouldn't feel abrupt or out of place. It shouldn't feel like the deck does nothing or everything depending on if it draws a certain three or four cards. If you've got a deck where a combo is the centerpiece, you should run tutors or big piles of draw in order to get there, with control cards used as a sort of extending element to buy the deck time. If you have a deck where it's going to take a long time to put together the combo, you should fill up space in the deck with a game plan that works concurrently with that setup process. Uh, that can be ramping in a deck where the combo is mana intensive, or running lots of draw in a deck where the combo involves looping with a number of different cards, or running tutors in a deck where getting discrete pieces together is a challenge. And then, once you've constructed a framework for piling on particular resources, you can devise how to fit in an alternative win plan that also takes advantage of those resources. Don't trust your combo to win you the game, because guess what? Removal, counters, and stacks exist, and optimizing your combo deck is going to put you at power levels where increasing quantities of these roadblocks exist. As a final point, I want to discuss the opposite of a combo deck with an alternative beatdown win con, that being a beatdown deck with an alternative combo win con. Now, this is a little more unusual, but hear me out here. Sometimes a beatdown deck is able to get ahead on resources, but then it gets locked out of swinging for onboard damage for some reason or other. For example, a couple years back, I built a $25 Grismolt the Dread Sour deck, a fast mid-range deck. Plan A of the deck is the pseudo Voltron beatdown plan, where the deck creates a bunch of tokens on board and then deletes said tokens in order to swing in for lethal amounts of commander damage. You might note, however, that the deck is not running blue, and a $25 budget is too small to afford nice shoes for my Grismold. And as you might expect, there are games where Grismold kinda just gets bullied out of existence by removal. So, what else can you do with a lot of tokens dying? Run some Blood Arst effects, of course. The win plan of generate tokens, place your Conrad, and then kill the tokens isn't as effective at killing players as a pure Voltron Grismold plan, but relying on the Grizzly plan alone is a bad idea, and having a backup means that the deck can win even if it just gets a couple medium-sized Grismold swings rather than living the dream and one-tapping three players back to back. The important point here is that both of these win cons use the same basic resource, tokens, so the deck doesn't really need to do anything different to have both of these win cons. And this is the crux of things, really. At lower powers, alternate win cons should ideally be using the same resources as the main win con, for the sake of deck cohesion. And when in doubt, just engineer your deck so that it has a meaty lad it can use, just in case. <laughs>